Okay, so I don't know how familiar everyone in the room here is uh, with the book of Esther. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different this morning. I was going to go through the book of Esther and just go through the story. Uh, the story might be familiar with some of you. For some of you who are not familiar with the story, you'll see that it's quite a, I think it's quite an entertaining <laughs> story. It's quite an interesting story in the Bible. So we'll go through each of the chapters. I'll just give you a bit of a summary and point out a few things that maybe you haven't noticed and some lessons that we can learn from the book of Esther, the book of Esther. So if you don't know where Esther is set, um, you kind of learn as you go through the, the chapters. Even though Eth the book of Esther is 10 chapters, the chapters are very short. They're quite short chapters and it's quite an interesting story. There's a lot of things happening in, in every chapter. It's a bit like Daniel when you read the first half of Daniel. The second half of Daniel is a little bit heavier with prophecy. But when you're reading through the first half of Daniel, there's a lot of interesting stories that the, the kids are going through and then what Daniel's going through. is. Esther's a bit like that. So you go through Esther. It's a very interesting story. I'll go through it with you and then you can read it again. And maybe this sermon will just help you as you read it again yourself. You'll know exactly what's going on if you haven't read it already. So the Esther is set, the book of Esther is set in the Medo-Persian Empire. So if you remember the, the Jews, they went into captivity uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and then the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And this is where the book of Esther is set, right? So King Ahasuerus is uh, the Medo-Persian king, right, in this, in this empire. So let's first go into chapter 1. We read chapter 2 because that's where you see Esther, you know, actually uh, being made queen instead of Vashti. But chapter 1 is where it all starts. So what happens in chapter 1? We'll just read first from Esther 1. It says here, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bitha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha, and Carcass. So if you're wondering, like, Victor, do you know how to pronounce these names? I just make it up, honestly. So you're just wondering, like, oh, is that how you pronounce those names? You just hear people read the Bible, and you hear, like, eh, it kind of sounds Hebrewish. I'm sure there's a proper way to pronounce them if you spoke Hebrew, but um, I just go from, like, what I've heard and, and how I expect these names to sound, and then I just kind of give it a shot. So if you're wondering, Victor, you know how to pronounce these? I don't. I just, I just say them. <laughs> the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty and she was fair to look on. So what's happening in chapter 1 is the king of the Medo-Persian Empire he has this queen, Queen Vashti, and he's, he has a, has a banquet for all these uh, you know, princes and governors and things like that, and Vashti's having it for all the women. And he wants to like, show his queen to all the people that he's invited to this, uh, this, um, this party that he's, he's holding. But then she refuses to come. So it says here in verse 12, But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Right, so he's asking the queen to come. She doesn't want to come. So this is, why, this is where it sets the scene to why Esther has an opportunity to become queen, right? This is what chapter 1 is about. And we see here, and Mamukan, in uh, verse 16, answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king. Ahasuerus. Why is that? Verse 17, For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. So what is he saying here? He's saying, oh, look, this is, you can't just let this slide. Why? Because Vashti is in a position of authority, in a position of responsibility. She's an example to other women. And because she has done this, if you don't deal with it, then this sort of example is going to spread throughout the kingdom. And all throughout the kingdom, you know, wives are going to despise their husbands. So what lesson do we want to learn from this, we want to learn that, hey, we need to be conscious of the impact of our example. You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, it's just me. It's not going to affect anyone else. If I don't do something or if I do this, nobody's going to notice. Well, we all have an example. You know, we have people that look up to us. Everyone, you have people that look to you. You know, if you're a Christian in your circle of influence, we want to be conscious of our impact and our example to other people. And it's, we're not an island. 
This is what we have to understand here. And this is what we see here. Even in the unbelieving world, they recognize this, that if Vashti did something and he, she has some level of significance, some level of influence, that example is going to have a negative impact on the people around them. And we see here that the wise men around King Ahasuerus noticed this, and this is why they wanted to do something about that. So we, what's the application here? We need to make sure we think about our example. You know how we talk, how we dress, how we behave, the things that we participate in. What sort of example are we setting? What kind of ambassador are we for Jesus Christ? We can see here the impact of Vashti's example and what did they do here. It says here in uh, verse 18, Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. So you see here in chapter 1, it's setting the scene of, hey, the king is upset with his queen and this is why he goes about to replace his queen. Now obviously that's not a necessarily a thing that we should do, right? But this is here in Unbelieving Empire. He's saying he's just going to get rid of his queen, he's going to get a new queen. And this is where we go into chapter 2 that we just read. So chapter 2, Esther 2. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Right? So Mordecai works in the palace of the king. You know, we don't really know how he got to that position, but this is where he is. So maybe he's heard that this is going to happen. You know, he puts up Esther to be uh, one of the candidates for queen. And this is where we learn where, you know, where Mordecai and Esther come from. Verse 6, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah. So that was the king that was reigning at the time when they went into captivity. Whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. So you don't want to be confused. They're not in the Babylonian kingdom. They're under the Medo-Persian Empire. But what it's saying here is that they came in while that captivity happened under King Babylon. Um, but now they're under the Medo-Persian Empire. And he brought up Hadassah. So Hadassah was her name as well. That is Esther, right? So these are names that Esther has. Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So now I, you know, we don't know the age difference between Mordecai and Esther. Normally when it's pictured, it's pictured that Mordecai is quite old, Esther's quite young, you know, because he took her on to be his daughter. So that's why we think that. But you can see here that they're actually cousins, aren't they? Because it's his uncle's daughter. So he's actually looking after his uncle's daughter. So he's looking after his cousin, who's Esther, but she's probably a lot younger cousin. So he takes her on as his daughter. For she had wife, or she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful. So we see here Esther was a very beautiful woman. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. Now this is a man. I, I always assume this is a woman, the keeper of the woman, but that's actually a man. That's uh, taking care of and responsible for the women that are going to be brought to the king. And I think he looks after the, the concubines as well. So we see here, and I, I'm obviously just going to the highlights in the different chapters, but you know, chapter 1, you see Vashti. Chapter 2 is where the king says, okay, well, we're going to replace uh, Vashti, and that's why they send a message into all the kingdom that we're going to look for a fair maiden, and the one that pleases the king is going to be the new queen. So Mordecai hears about this, and he actually puts Esther up to be one of the candidates um, to be chosen by, uh, by the king. Now, the lesson I thought we could take from this and one of the practical applications is sometimes in life, you got to be in it to win it. You know what I mean? I'm sure maybe Esther was thinking, oh, who am I to be the wife of the king? You know, and sometimes in, in our life, it's the same, you know, you, especially people that are dating. They think, oh, you know, well, that, that woman's popular or beautiful or whatever. What would she think of me? Or, you know, you know that guy's popular or whatever. Hey, sometimes you just got to go for it. Sometimes it's like that in business as well. Sometimes you think, oh, who am I to, to do this or to do that? And sometimes you just got to give it a shot. You just think like, well, if 
Mordecai and Esther just never put their ring in the hat, or put their hat in the ring to do this, I mean, we would never have this story today. I'm sure there were doubts. I'm sure there were fears. I'm sure there were things like that. But one thing we can take away from this is, you know, we know the story of Esther, that Esther succeeded. Esther became queen. Esther d delivered her people, as we're going to hear about. But if she just said, no, no, you know, we can see here Mordecai trying to encourage her to do something great. But what if she just said, no, 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 I'm not going to try. I'm too scared. No, it's not for me. It's all that sort of stuff. Well, then she maybe have missed out on doing something very great. So I think it can encourage singles. It can encourage people that are trying to do things, you know, that maybe are a bit out of their comfort zone. We see here, hey, you gotta, sometimes you've got to be in it to win it. Right? You've got to give it a shot. Let's continue in chapter 2. There's a few things I want to point out in chapter 2 I think are pretty cool. Uh, then thus came every maiden unto the king. So they've gathered up these uh, fair and beautiful ladies all over the kingdom. Esther's one of them. It says here, they came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired, and you might have missed this when uh, Lewis was reading it, so I'm going to just explain what's going on here. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Sheazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. So what's going on here? It says here, all the ladies are gathered up. Look at what it says here. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women. So what's going on here? I think they're under Haggai here. They're in one house. They go visit the king. And they go into the second house. Shaz Gaz looks after that house. What does it mean by whatsoever she desired was given her? What's happening here, what I believe is happening here, is that she's allowed to doll herself up in whatever way she wants. Right? So it's like, hey, if she wants a certain dress or certain jewellery, wants her hair done a certain way or anything like that, however she wants to, to sort of stand out before the king, they, they said, hey, you can dress yourself up however you want. Right? So every lady could decide how they wanted to dress themselves up and make themselves pretty to go in before the king. And whatever they wanted, they were allowed to have. Right? So they, 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 they dressed themselves up, whatever they wanted to do, clothing they wanted to wear, how they wanted their hair to be, in the evening, they went to the king, right, to go see him. Then they went to the second house, and then that's all, right? So they just had one opportunity to go to the king, and they could only go back to the king if the king delighted in that woman and wanted to see her again. Verse 15. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go, was, when her turn was come, to go in unto the king. Look at this. I want you to notice this. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the woman, appointed. So notice there that uh, Esther does not ask for anything more than what is required. Because obviously there's probably a certain standard that is required of these people to go into the king. And what it's saying here is Esther didn't do anything more than what was required of her by Haggai, the, the, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the woman. And look what happened. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. And what's the lesson that we can take away from this? Sometimes, for women, sometimes less is more. Sometimes less is more. I'm not talking about clothing. Right? You want to have modest... I'm talking about the fanciness of your clothing. Right? Less is not more. Less is less when it comes to clothing. Right? But sometimes less in terms of extravagance is more. And think about what happens today, right? Women just go way over the top, caking on the makeup, 
They use the fancy dresses, the fancy hair, the fancy hat, and now they're even like, you know, injecting things into their lips. Have you ever, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen ladies like that. When you look at them and you're just like, whoa, you've just gone way over the top. Like you don't even realize what you look like now. You know, they've got the lips and the cheeks and everything. And here we see sometimes less is more. You know, people are so, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, so fixated on trying to look different that they end up looking the same as everyone else in the world. And nowadays, if you want to look different, you just got to look normal. You know, just look, just look normal, which is normal hair and normal clothes, and then you're going to be unique. All right, people? So if you want to be unique, you just got to be normal. You know, just be godly, just be a godly Christian girl, and you're going to be extreme to the world standards. You just look normal. You have normal lips, normal eyes, normal cheeks, you know, normal hair. And look what happened here. She just did nothing more than what was required. And man, wow, she stood out more amongst the other ladies. And it might have been so, because sometimes women, they compensate physical attributes for actual character. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes if you tone down the physical, you tone down the, the, you know, the, the lust you know, stuff that girls wear, and it's all about showing your breasts and showing your butt and all that sort of stuff, people might be able to connect with your character a bit more. You know, I know uh, I, I can speak for myself, definitely, and I'm sure I can speak for most of the guys in the room, that if a girl's a little bit too revealing, it's a little hard to connect with that girl, right? You want to just talk to her like a person? I'd say here that if she just looks a bit modest and normal, maybe that's why he noticed her character a bit more, found more favor in his sight and things like that. So the less you emphasize the outward appearance, the more the inner man is going to come out, right? Because you're trying to not draw attention to necessarily your body parts, but you know, to your face, to your personality, to things like that. So I think that's the lesson we can take away from that. I don't know if you noticed that about Esther, right? That she actually did not do as much as the other ladies, and yet not only was she noticed amongst all the people, but also the king. And this is the reason why the king, one of the reasons why, I'm sure, the king chose her over the other ladies. Oh, let's continue. In those days, so now we get to the end of chapter 2, so this is how we see how Esther became the queen, and then we see here, it's like a little footnote of this chapter, but it becomes a big deal later on, right? Esther 2, verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. So what's happening here? There's an assassination plot that's going on, right, at the king's gate. Two of his servants are trying to conspire to kill the king, and Mordecai hears of it, right? He hears of it, it says verse 22, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name, right? So what's she saying? Saying Esther made it short, saying, hey, I heard this of Mordecai. And when inquisition was made of the matter, so now the king sends out people to go find out, is this really true? It was found out. Therefore they were both hanged on a tree. Who? Big Than and Teresh. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So kind of a footnote there that, you know, it's a small thing, you know, not a small thing, but a big thing, but the Mordecai actually saves the king's life. And here it's noted down, and then it's just forgotten about, right, that he did this great Thing. And that's going to become part of the story later on. But the lesson we want to take away from this is God will honor your right doing, even if man doesn't. Right? You see, yeah, Mordecai, he didn't necessarily get recognized here. He did what was right. And even though you know, it, was, it was written down, it was recorded, but there was no celebration, there was no fanfare here. Right? But he still did what was right. And I think that's what we can apply in our Christian life. Sometimes you don't always get the recognition you deserve. Sometimes you don't always get the fanfare. Sometimes you don't always get maybe what, in return what you deserve for what you've done. But just because man doesn't honor you, that doesn't mean God will not honor you. God sees everything we do. And, if, and you know what? If man doesn't honor you, hey, you should rejoice because you know what? God's going to make it right. So sometimes when you don't get recognized here, remember when Jesus talked about man wanting to be recognized, he says, hey, those that want to get recognized, they have their reward, right? But if you, you go and you pray in your closet, you do those things because, hey, great is your reward in heaven. 
right? So that's something we can take away from here. Is hey, even though you may not get the recognition you deserve, doesn't mean you shouldn't do what's right. You should always do what's right because you know what? Ultimately, God is going to honor you when it comes to uh, the um, judgment seat of Christ. All right, now we get into chapter three, and now chapter three we are introduced to Haman. Haman. You know, it's kind of like a picture of Satan, you know, the enemy of God's people. He's the main, you know, uh, aggravator here in the story. And we learn a bit about him. After these things, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And, you know, it's like that in the world. We don't want to necessarily get discouraged when sometimes evil and wicked people make it in the world. I mean, the Bible talks about this a lot. Well, yeah, hey, they, have, they may have it great in this world, but one day their day is coming, right? So don't ever be envious. Don't ever be uh, envious of these wicked people and the things they may accomplish through, uh, you know, dishonest means, right? We just need to make sure we're doing the right thing and, and, and live with integrity and honesty. After these things, did King Azarias promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. But the king had so commanded concerning him. So not only does Haman want this reverence, but it's a commandment <coughs> from the king. It's something that, is, that they are commanded to do by law. But look at this. But Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence. So it's a bit like today when everyone just, you know, just bow, you know, bows down, like figuratively, right, to our politicians and just the people in, in charge and they say, hey, you know, you can't speak against anything against what they do. No, we see here that Haman, uh, Mordecai knew that Haman was somebody not worth reverencing and then when he walked past, even though the king commanded that they would bow down and reverence him, he refused to do it, knowing that Haman was a wicked person. <coughs> then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, Look at this. Look at, the, the, look at the pressure here from society to conform to something that ought not to be done, right? Which is to reverence a man. Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman, right? Now they're, trying, they're escalating. They're trying to get him in trouble to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand for he had told them that he was a Jew. So who knows? Uh, maybe they did this in spite of his religion, you know, in spite of what he believed, but sometimes you'll get in trouble, like we talked about in Kids Club. Kids, sometimes you'll suffer for being a believer, sometimes for being a Christian. Back then, it was being a Jew. And maybe because he was a Jew, they went and tried to persecute him and dob him in to Haman. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. So you see here, this really angered Haman. So, you know, don't take into account that everyone else, the whole other kingdom, you know, is, is bowing down and reverencing him, just not Mordecai. But yet, Haman wanted Mordecai to bow down. It wasn't good enough for him that 99% of the kingdom worshipped him. He wanted Mordecai to bow down and worship him too. So don't underestimate the difference you make, you know, when you take a stand. You know, it, it angers, you know, those that are <laughs> in charge because they want full compliance, don't they? When somebody just takes a stand... It upsets them. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So what is the lesson we can take away here? Sometimes doing what right, doing what is right, isn't always popular. Sometimes doing what is right doesn't always have a positive impact on people. Right here, what Mordecai has done has now threatened his whole nation, right? But because of what he's doing, the right that he is doing now has brought wrath of Haman upon the whole of the Jews, and he actually wants to kill all of them. So Haman, now Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. So you see, sometimes doing what's right, we don't always measure what's right based on the outcome. 
Right? Sometimes doing what's right isn't always what's popular. Does that mean we shouldn't do what's right? We shouldn't stand for what's right? No. We need to stand for what is right. That's what's most important. But we leave to God sometimes the onflow of what will happen from taking a stand for what is right. And now we see in Esther 3, this letter sent out, which is the extermination of the Jews. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month. So why Haman was so upset, so angry with Mordecai, that he petitioned of the king. He kind of did it in a sneaky way as well. He basically said, hey, you know, king, there are these people in your kingdom, and they don't follow your rules, you know, because they're not bowing down to me. They don't, they don't follow your commands. They follow their own commandments. So it's not profitable for us to have them in the kingdom. So that's why the king said, all right, do what you want, hire the people you need, and go get rid of them. So that's what happens to this letter. These letters are sent out to kill all the Jews, old, women, men, young and old. But notice, it's in one day. So there is a judgment day coming, right? Even upon the 13th day of the 12th month. And this letter is sent out, if you want the timeline, it's now the, in the first month. So there's like 11 months away. This day is coming, which is the month Ada. And to take the spoil of them for a prey. <clears throat> so basically what this law is saying is there will be a day where the enemies of the Jews are allowed to just like legally just kill them all. As many as one. One day. Right? The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The posts went out being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given in Shushan the palace and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city, Shushan, was perplexed. What does that mean? They were like, they were, they were shocked. They were like, what's going on? It was a bit like in Daniel, when the king just wanted to just kill all the wise men. And Daniel's like, what's going on? Like, how come the king is so hasty? It's like here, everyone's thinking like, why is there all of a sudden this law going out where one day we're just going to be slaughtered? They don't necessarily know what's going on. Why? Because Haman had conspired to, you know, fulfill his will. Right? to kill all of God's people. We can see here, as you, you read through this story, you can sometimes see the picture of Haman and Satan. You know, Satan wanting to wage war on God's people, like it is in the end times. Now we get to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is kind of like one of the climactic passages where really this is where Esther is challenged by Mordecai to go and beseech the king. Right? Esther 4 verse 8. It says here, and he says, uh, he shows Esther. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther. So what's happening? Because Mordecai, he hears about what's happening, comes in to the city, and he's like in ash cloth, ashes and sackcloth, right? How they would mourn in the Bible. And he's wailing and crying out. So Esther tries to get, send somebody, right? To go talk to Mordecai, to clothe him and say, it's okay, it's okay. what's going on? But he refuses, right? So he gives a copy to this messenger of the writing to give it to Esther to explain what's going on and to declare it under her, to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for the people. So Mordecai says to Esther, hey, you've got to go in to the king and make requests for the Jews, right? Try and get the king to change his mind. Now Esther says to Mordecai, she says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king, into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come into unto the king these thirty days. Day. So what's going through Esther's mind? Esther's saying, look, I can't just go into the king because there's a law that if I go in unto the king and you come in unbidden, you're not asked to come in, unless the king holds out the golden scepter, basically accepts your uninvited presence, you're going to be put to death. Right? So she realizes if he doesn't hold out the golden scepter, I may be put to death. And you know what? She's saying, the king hasn't asked me to come before his presence in the last 30 days. So she's thinking, like, maybe he's obviously not wanting to see me. I haven't seen him for like the last month. So 
Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. So they're talking between messengers. They're sending messengers between each other. He says to her, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. He's saying, if you don't do anything, you're not going to escape this judgment either, right? Because you're a Jew and you, may, you can be killed under this law. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And these are some powerful words. What is going on here? Mordecai is saying to her, you know what, he knows. Why is he saying deliverance is going to come from someone else? Because he knows God will not let his people just be completely wiped off the face of the earth, right? So he knows there's always going to be a remnant left. But what he's saying here is, yeah, deliverance to the Jews may come from another place. God may save a remnant, but he says, but you and your father's house will die in this, right? Because you're not going to necessarily flee. You're going to be in the kingdom when this happens. And he says, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And what's amazing here is, you know, sometimes we are put in a position to do a task. And when that task comes to call, you might think, well, I'm in this position. But here he's saying to Esther, how do you know that God has not raised you up to be queen because of this, because of this time, to save your people? Because often we think, oh, you know, maybe I got there because of my own doing. I got there because, you know, I was so pretty or I was so wise or I did this. And Mordecai is reminding her, how do you know that God hasn't put you in this situation for such a time as this? And you know what? Doing what's right sometimes can come at a great loss. And you think, oh, you know, well, maybe I could make a difference if I was in more a position of influence, more a position of power, if I had more resources. But you know, often the more power, the more influence, the more you have, the more you have to lose to do what's right as well. So I don't think it becomes any easier. You know, if you can't do what's right when you're like, you know, quote unquote, you're like a nobody, meaning like, you know, you're not well known, you don't have a lot of influence, you don't have a lot of power, you may not have a lot of resources, and you're not doing what's right because you're worried about, you know, what Joe or Jane thinks at the office or whatever. I mean, are you going to do it when the whole world is watching you? So it's the same here with Esther. You know, yeah, obviously she has a lot of influence, but that doesn't make it any easier to do what she's about to do. But who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom? Who knows whether God put Esther in this position for such a time as this. Then Esther bade them return. She asked them, okay, go back to your houses. Uh, oh, sorry, bade them return. She's talking about the messengers to go back to Mordecai. Mordecai, this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king. And this is the attitude we should have when it comes to doing what's right which is not according to the law. Look at this. And if I perish, I perish. These are words that Esther is famous for. And she was willing. She said, you know what, Mordecai? That's the right thing to do. You go away for three days. You fast for me. My, me and my maidens, we're going to fast as well. I'm going to go in under the king. And she says, you know what? If I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. Why? Because some things are worth dying for. Right, you can see here, this is something worth dying for, that she could go in and beseech the king on behalf of her people. This was the time to put her own personal interests aside, her own life aside and do something right. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. All right, chapter 5. Chapter 5. Now we see how here how Queen... And I'll try and go through these chapters a little bit quicker. Chapter 5 is now we see how Queen Esther beseeches the king. It says, It was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So, phew, you know, she went in, you know, she got the golden scepter, so she wasn't put to death. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. 
Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be given, it shall even, uh, it shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. So you see this phrase said even of Solomon, you know, when he says to his mom Bathsheba, Hey, I'll give you even unto the half of thy king, my kingdom. So you can see here that this seems to be a phrase in these kings to say, basically, ask whatever you want, but you just can't obviously ask for the kingdom. You know, overpower me, right? Have more than half of the kingdom. <clears throat> and Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now you say, you ask, hey Esther, I thought you were meant to go in there and then just ask of Haman, so they say, and say, like, king, somebody's trying to kill my people. I need you to reverse the law. But there's some wisdom here from Esther, isn't it? It's almost like, hey, before you want to ask a man of power for something important, maybe you want to feed the man first, you know? Like maybe you know, do something nice, get him on your side. And it seems like, hey, Esther kind of did that. Like, she didn't just go in and just tell him what was up. She said, hey, I want to invite you to a banquet that I'm preparing. And I want to invite Haman as well. Now, I don't know everything that was going through Esther's mind because you never even see her talking about it with Mordecai, but it shows here what we can take away. This Esther, Esther, she had a bit of wisdom in the way she approached things, in the way she approached authority. And, you know, we can take lessons from this. Sometimes you need to beseech something from a boss. Sometimes you might want to ask something of me, you know, something so you want to ask something of your husband or ask something of your parents. You know, you don't want to just put your foot down and lay the law down or just nag them and things like that. Maybe there, it requires a bit of wisdom to beseech and go about how you may go about things to get them on site, right? So Esther 5, 9. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful, and with a glad heart. So why is he glad? Because she invites, basically what happens is she invites the king, she invites Haman to this banquet, they come to this banquet and she doesn't even tell them what she wants at that banquet. They say, hey, Esther, what is your request? And she says, hey, I'm going to have a, another banquet tomorrow. I want you and Haman to come and then I'll tell you what my request is. So I don't know if she's just trying to build up some curiosity or, you know, trying to wine and dine him and things like that. But that's how she goes about it. So Haman is happy. Right, so he's happy and glad, and we find out why later on, because he's, yeah, he's invited, he feels very important, he's invited to this special banquet, just him and the king, right? Esther's prepared. But when Haman saw, but look at this, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Why? So because he walks past Mordecai, and Mordecai doesn't even notice him, doesn't even care, doesn't stand up to greet him, nothing, just walks past it says, nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. When he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife, so he calls around to make him feel good. Haman told them of the glory of his riches. Here he is, he's boasting. And the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, Yea, Esther, the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. So you see, he's talking up that he doesn't know what's coming, right? But he's talking himself up because he gets to go and have this special banquet with the king, just him and the king and Esther. But look at this in verse 13. And this, you can really get the mindset of somebody that is wicked, right? Yet all this avail me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So what does he say? Hey, all these riches, all my, all my family, all this honor means nothing to me when I see this person not bowing down to me. That's why you wonder, you know, why, why is sometimes Satan so upset? It's like it's not good enough for him. It's not good enough for him out of all the riches of the world. He wants us to bow at his feet. So you can take great pleasure, you know, knowing maybe you take a stand, wicked people, uh, it bugs <laughs> verse 14 then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet and the thing pleased Haman and he caused the gallows to be made so what does his friends say they say why don't you make a gallows like when you hang somebody 
50 you know, cubits high, was it 50 feet high, 50 cubits high? 50 cubits high, and then kill Mordecai on that, and then you can go to the banquet all happy, right? And Mordecai doesn't exist. Now we get on to chapter 6. Chapter 6. In chapter 6 we see, I think, this sort of proves that God has a sense of humour <laughs> to cause this to happen. Esther 6. He says, On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So the king's struggling to get to sleep. So he says, okay, bring me the book of the chronicles of the king and read me a bedtime story. You know? And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king and has their ears. So the people are reading him, the book of the kings of the chronicles, and he learns, hey, Mordecai, did this great thing and saved my life. So verse 3, the king said, what honour and dignity, dignity had been done to Mordecai for this? He's saying, hey, how have we recognised Mordecai for saving my life and foiling this assassination plot? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. We skip down to verse 6, and this is the funny part. So Haman came in. And why was he coming in? Because he wanted to tell the king about the gallows that he had made to kill Haman on, uh, to kill Mordecai on. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this story, but this is a very funny twist of events. So the king said unto him, so Haman comes in to tell him this thing, and the first thing the king says to him, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honour? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honour more than to myself? So he comes in, the king says, hey, I want to honour somebody, what shall I do to him? And Haman, being the proud man that he is, thinks, hey, he must be talking about me. I'm going to get on it. Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honour, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear. He's going to put on the king's robes, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. So you see here like how Haman's likened to Satan. He wants to be like the Most High, right? He wants to wear the king's robe, sit on the king's horse, wear the king's crown. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighted to honour, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim him. Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honour. So you see, he wants to wear the king's clothes, king's horse, king's crown, one of the most noble of the kings, to go and array him, and then take him around the city and say, Thus do to the man whom the king delighted to honour. Verse 10. And the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. And see that at the king's gate. And nothing fail of all that thou hast Hey, Make sure you do everything that you said to do, do it to Mordecai. And I'm sure you can know what's going through Haman's head as he's doing. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honour. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning, having his head covered, right, in shame. Right, remember, he went to the king to kill Mordecai. And what was the result? He had to array him and then, I guess, like, you know, go before him, telling everyone, hey, this is what's going to be done. He was the one that had to say that right, because he was one of the most noble princes. All right, chapter 7. Then the king Ahasuerus. Oh, and what I want to, some of the lessons I just wanted to mention from chapter 5. Um, I already talked about Esther being wise, but something I think we can also learn, because obviously Haman represents wickedness, rec represents Satan. But sometimes we can have those characteristics, right? And you know, he was bitter against Mordecai. And it came back to bite him. And one thing, one thing I think about here is sometimes when you're bitter against other people, you only end up hurting yourself. It's like here with Haman. You know, he was bitter against Mordecai and he sought to, you know, sort of do evil to somebody else. And then it just came back to bite him. And sometimes if you're bitter, if you have somebody that you're bitter against in your life, you need to understand that sometimes it's only, you're only doing damage to yourself. You're not hurting the other person. And I uh, like here, you know, it came back to bite uh, Haman. All right, chapter 7. 
Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that doth presume in his heart to do so? So chapter 7 is where now Haman goes to the banquet. This is after he's had to honour Mordecai. And this is where Esther breaks the news. This is where Esther breaks the news to King Ahasuerus that Haman is the one that has plotted to kill her people. Right? Because she says to the king, somebody wants to kill all my people. And he's like, who would do such a wicked thing? And he says, this Haman. Right? And because the king loved Esther so much, he got so angry that Haman had done this wicked thing. He says, who is he? And where is he that durst? The durst is the past tense of dare. You wonder what that word means, durst. Who dared presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. So the king, at this point, storms out because he's just like so upset with Haman. So when he walks out, Haman is like begging Esther. You know, and you can imagine that, you know, he's like begging her, like, please don't let the king like kill me and everything. He's probably backing her up. She's falling, you know, maybe falling onto a couch or to a bed. Why? Because when the king comes back in, then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine. So he's, come, he's gone out to kind of like maybe vent. And Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Why? Because he was begging her like to not let the king kill him. Then said the king, so he sees her, him begging, uh, Haman begging Esther. And he thinks, will he force the queen also before me in the house? So he's saying, is he also going to like, you know, lay with my queen before me? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also, the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So we see here, that's a bit of a picture of, you know, putting sin on the cross, you know, hanging. But we see here that the, 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 uh, the, the, I guess the irony, right? Is it irony? Where Haman built this gallows for Mordecai and then yet Haman ended up being hanged on his own gallows. All right, chapter 8. Just a couple more chapters. Chapter 8. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So chapter 8 is now, so Haman is now dead, and you know, Mordecai is actually given over, Mordecai is appointed over Haman's stuff. So you remember Haman had a lot of power in the kingdom. Mordecai is now put over because he puts Esther over what Haman had, and then Esther puts Mordecai over that stuff. But remember, that law that went out on the 13th day of the 12th month is still in effect. So this is why Esther now goes in before the king again, right, to besiege the king. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Now, this is one thing in the Medo-Persian Empire. Is a, it's a bit the same, right? Like in, in Daniel's day as well. When they wrote a law and sealed it with the king's ring, they could not alter that law. That law could no longer be changed. So what does he say to Esther? What is the solution? He, says, he basically says, hey, I'm going to give you my ring. You now have the power, or Mordecai has the power, to write whatever you like to try and counteract this law that's in effect. But you can't just appeal this law, right? A new law has to be put in effect. You write whatever you want and you seal it with the king's ring. It says, write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. You see there? That's why that initial law cannot be changed. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month seven, on the three and twentieth day of the month. So all these events that we've been reading about, you can see it's happening over two months, right? Because it's still quite a fair ways away from the twelfth month, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month. And it was written according to all that Mordecai, 
commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and rulers of the provinces which are from India unto Ethiopia and 120 and seven provinces unto every province according to the writing thereof and unto every people after their language and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. And he wrote in the king Ahasuerus's name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by posts on horseback and riders on mules, camels and young dromedaries wherein the king granted the Jews. So what, what did he write and what did he send out to reverse or to nullify or to withstand what was already written, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Hadar. And then we just skip down to verse 17, and I'll give you a few thoughts on uh, what's going on here. Verse 17. And in the, every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for fear of the Jews fell upon them. So you can see the picture here is a picture also of the gospel going out and people being converted, obviously, to being a Jew here in the Medo-Persian Empire. But what actually happened here? So remember, they can't change the law. So what do they do? They write a new law to say, on the 13th day of the 12th month, we can't reverse that law, but what we're going to do is we're going to give the Jews the authority to stand against anyone that may try and enact that law, may try and execute that law, right? And he's saying, on the 13th day of the 12th month, if anyone tries to attack you, you have the authority to withstand and attack them, attack them back and take their goods for a prey unto yourselves. But we see here that the Jews, they end up defending themselves, but they don't take the prey. But because they now have this power, right? And this authority under the king, people are very happy. And because of this, a lot of people feared the Jews and many became Jews in that time. Verse 9, we've got two more chapters. This one's uh, just very short. Chapter 10, if you didn't know, it was only three verses as well. So I'm going to read all those three verses. So chapter 9 is now we see the Jews defending themselves. In the 12th month, that is the month Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put to execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. So you see how they hoped that this initial law was powerful enough to overcome them, but they didn't realize that the new law that had come into effect was even more powerful than the law that already stood. The Jews hoped to have power, or enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them, that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the princes, provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt, and no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all the people. And we'll skip down um, to verse 20. And Mordecai, so there was a great deliverance, right, because they ended up defeating their enemies that day on the 13th day of the month, 12th. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king, Azurus, both nigh and far. Uh, so this is possibly the, the book of Esther, right, written by Mordecai, to establish this amongst, among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. So because they defended themselves on the 13th, they then celebrated on the 14th, they also celebrated on the 15th, that they made this a celebration. And you can't help but see the parallel here between the Passover, right? There was a great deliverance. The 14th day of the, of the first month was the, the Passover, and the 15th day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's almost like here, even in the Medo-Persian Empire, there's like a similarity of a holiday that is now celebrated yearly that is similar or likened, you know, the 14th day and 15th month of, of the Passover. And it's interesting here that we also see, like, you know, that, uh, there, that it's likened to the Gospel here. And that's what we're going to see at the end here. The days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day and that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. 
And lastly, we just want to read in chapter 10. These are the only three verses in chapter 10. So kids, if your parents tell you to read a chapter of the Bible, just go to Ezra chapter 10. That's one chapter, three verses. And the king Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and his mind and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto king Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. So, just in conclusion, it's an interesting story. I hope that uh, you sort of learned something there today. But besides the story of Esther and all the events that were happening, you don't want to miss sometimes when you read through these stories the prophetic nature of these books. And we sort of already alluded how Haman you know, was likened to Satan and how Satan is persecuting God's people, how God's people are delivered. But one of the most powerful things I see in this story is you know, the gospel and how the gospel is throughout this story. And we just want to finish on this verse in Hebrews 4. It says here, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Right? And how is that? Because if you notice, there's the, the parallel of the gospel in the book of Esther, that there is this law that is decreed by the king that cannot be altered, that is sent out and it is a condemnation onto a group of people, onto a people. And that's like the, the law of sin with us. God has the wages of sin is death, and that law cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. And judgment day is coming. But what can happen? There can be a new law introduced, a new law, right? The law of grace, that when we thought we were overpowered by the law, the, the law of works, right? The law of sin, we have the law of grace that overcomes the law of sin. So we can see here that the gospel is being preached throughout this story where there is a judgment day coming, but a new law goes out. And that's like the gospel. That's the law of grace that is more powerful than even the law of the wages of sin is death. So this new law grants us deliverance, just like the new law in the book of Esther grants them deliverance. But if you remember in the book of Esther, if that new law was written, but the Jews did not stand, they did not act on that law, right? Would they have been delivered? No. So you see how they all, there was the old law that condemned them, there was the new law that was passed, but they had to act on it, right? They had to t in, the, in this story, they had to take the stand and fight back. Now, how is that likened into the New Testament? You want to think, oh, do we then have to fight in order to be saved? No, we just have to act on the new law. Because there the law was, you had to fight back. But what's the law in the New Testament? All we have to do is put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says here, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But look at this. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in them that heard it. You see, you can know what it means to be saved, you can understand what it means to be saved, but if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't act, you know, you don't act on the word that has been preached and in salvation, that's believing, mixing it with faith. It's not going to profit you. So beware, guys, beware that you don't just know in the head what it means to be saved. You need to make sure you believe what it takes to be saved. So not only that, we have that picture in Esther of the gospel. And we need to get the word out. Remember the posts were hastened by the king's commandment. When they went out, that's how they got the word out for people to believe and to people to take a stand in the book of Esther. And ultimately as well, you know, we want to have the boldness of Esther and also the meekness of Mordecai. So you notice here that at the end, the last chapter of the book of Esther, it's actually praising Mordecai for what Mordecai did. But the book is named after the book of Esther. So they both got their honor in one way or another. But we want to have the boldness of Esther, but the meekness of Mordecai. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this story of Esther. Oh, Lord, Esther, you know, just, uh, just she's such a bold and courageous woman for doing what she did. 
And uh, Lord, I just pray that you give us the grace to be able to take a stand and say, if I perish, I perish. And Lord, to, to have the boldness and of meekness of Mordecai as well, that, Lord, we don't do things seeking our own profit as we see here in uh, chapter 10, but just seeking the good of his people, seeking peace for his people and doing what's right no matter what the consequences. So thank you, Lord, for these examples we have in the Bible. May it encourage us and exhort us in the day and age that we live in. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.